Hello and welcome to The Postcard Professor, where we take complex ideas and explain them in the space of a postcard. In this video, we're going to be describing different shape functions that we can use for bar or truss elements. First off, the goal of our shape functions is to take our nodal displacements, our u values, our u1, u2, u3, and turn those nodal displacements into a continuous function. Meaning that if we know all of our nodal displacements, we can figure out what the displacement is at any point along our bar or truss. So to get a picture of this, let's take a look at a simple example displacement. So we're going to be looking at a graph of position versus displacement. So our bar is going to go from x equals 0 to x equals L. And let's say that our bar has a displacement of 1 at x equals 0 and a displacement of 0 at x equals L. Well, in that case, the simplest thing we can do to determine what our continuous function is in between these two nodes is simply to draw a line in between them. You can also see this as linear interpolation, but we're just drawing a straight line between those two points. Now, this is also the most simplistic shape function that we can use. So I'm going to give this a name. I'm going to call this psi1, and we can define psi1 as 1 minus x over l. Now, we can do the same thing, but this time let's say that our displacement at 0 is equal to 0, and at l it's equal to 1. We're still going to have a straight line, but the slope is going to be in the opposite direction. And our shape function here is just x over l. Setting up this way makes our life really easy once we get our nodal displacements. Because if we want to find the displacement at any point here, we can just take the actual displacement at x equals 0 and multiply it by our psi1 shape function and add that to our displacement at L multiplied by psi2. So the end result here is that u of x is simply equal to u1 multiplied by psi1 plus u2 multiplied by psi2. And of course, these psi's are functions of x. Now, if we want to go more complex, we can look to a set of polynomials known as the Lagrange polynomials. And we want to use this anytime that we're trying to create higher order elements. Now, in this video, we're just going to go one step above our linear and look at the Lagrange quadratic. And all I mean by that is this is the Lagrange polynomial that has a maximum order of 2. So we know that u of x is going to be some coefficient multiplied by x squared plus some coefficient multiplied by x plus some coefficient just multiplied by 1. Now, we have three unknowns here. Looking at our linear element with just two unknowns, we only needed to specify the location at two nodes. With three unknowns, we need to specify the location at one additional node. So the way we usually do this is we still have x equals 0. We still have x equals L. But then we just add one more node in the middle where x equals L over 2. Our procedure here is now pretty simple. We're just going to define what the displacement is based off of this function at these three points. So at x equals 0, that's just going to be equal to a3 according to our function. And according to our definitions over here, it's going to be equal to u1. It's our, it's our first displacement. At the other end, u of l, we just plug that in. And that will be equal to u3, our third node. Then finally, we have u of l over 2, which we can plug in and set equal to u2. So now we have a system of three equations to solve and three unknowns. And you can do this a number of ways. My favorite is just to set up the matrix system of equations and solve it that way. Our first equation just says that u1 is equal to a3. So these first two values are 0, and then we have a 1. 
Then we have u2 is equal to l squared over 4 times a1 plus l over 2 times a2 plus 1 times a3. And then finally, we have l squared, l, and 1 for our final row. With these values, we can go ahead and solve for our a's. So a1 is equal to 2 over l squared multiplied by u1 minus 4 over l squared multiplied by u2 plus 2 over l squared multiplied by u3. a2 looks a little different. And then finally, a3 is simply u1. So now we can take these a values and plug them in to our original function up here. So our u of x is going to be equal to x squared, and then I'm going to take out the l squared just to make things a little easier. So we get x squared over l squared, all multiplied by 2 times u1 minus 4 times u2 plus 2 times u3. Then we can do the same for a2. And then finally, a3 is nice and simple. Now, to get our shape functions, all we really need to do is just rewrite this so that we're grouping our u1, u2, and u3 together. So our u of x here is going to be u1 multiplied by 2 times x squared over l squared minus 3x over l plus 1. u2 is going to have minus 4x squared over l squared plus 4x over l. And then finally, u3 has 2x squared over l squared minus x over l. So as I said, this function here is psi 1, this is psi 2, and this is psi 3. And the key property of these functions is that they are 1 on the node of question and 0 everywhere else. So if we look at psi 1 and we set x equal to 0, then we see very quickly that psi 1 of 0 is equal to 1. But then if we look at psi 1 of l, x over l just becomes 1. So this is 2 minus 3 plus 1. And we just get 0 at x equals l. And then finally, we can plug in L over 2. And so we get 1 half minus 3 halves plus 1, which ends up at 0 again. Now, we know this is a polynomial. So the shape of our shape function here just looks like so. Psi 3 is easy because it's simply symmetric to psi 1. And we can prove that really quick. Psi 3 is equal to 0 at x equals 0. And then if we plug in x equals l over 2, then we get 1 half minus 1 half, so 0 here as well. And then finally, at l equals 1, then we just get 2 minus 1, or 1. And drawing that, we just get the symmetric shape. Then finally, for psi 2, at x equals l over 2, we'll end up with a value of 1, and then we'll have 0 at the other two points. So we'll just have a nice, simple parabola here. So our shape functions are psi 1, this is psi 3, and our last one was psi 2. And once again, we see that our continuous position function is simply equal to our nodal displacements multiplied by our shape functions. So once we find our nodal displacements, we can use these shape functions to take a step back and find our displacement at any point if we need it. So that's a quick overview of shape functions, uh, the very basic that we can use for the most basic element, and then one step up for that most basic element. So I'm going to continue talking about shape functions, but our next video is going to be talking about the beam element. So I hope you found this informative, and I will catch you next time.